the next 16 minutes, I'm going to take you to a journey that is probably the biggest dream of humanity. Understand the code of life. So for me, everything started many, many years ago when I met the first 3D printer. The concept was fascinating. A 3D printer needs three elements. A bit of information, some raw material, some energy, and it can produce any object that was not there before. I was doing physics, I was coming back home, and I realized that I actually always knew a 3D printer, and everyone does. It was my mom. <laughs> so my mom takes uh, three elements. A bit of information is between my father and my mom, in this case, raw elements and energy in the same media, that is food, and after several months, produces me. And I was not existing before. So apart from the shock of my mom discovering that she was a 3D printer, uh, I, immediately, I immediately got mesmerized by that piece, the first one, the information. What amount of information takes to build and assemble a human? Is it much? Is it little? How many thumb drives you can fill? Well, I was studying physics at the beginning, uh, and I took uh, this approximation of a human as a gigantic Lego piece. Okay? So, you can imagine that the building blocks are little atoms, and there is an hydrogen here, a carbon here, a nitrogen here. So in the first approximation, if I can list the number of atoms that compose a human being, I can build it. Now, you can run some numbers, and that happens to be quite an astonishing number. So the number of atoms, the file that I will save in my thumb drive to assemble a little baby, it will actually fill an entire Titanic of thumb drives, multiplied 2,000 times. This is the miracle of life. Every time you see from now on a pregnant lady, she's assembling the biggest amount of information that you will ever encounter. Forget big data, forget anything you have heard of. This is the biggest amount of information that exists. <laughs> But nature Fortunately, is much smarter than a young physicist. And in four billion years, he managed to pack this information in a small crystal we call DNA. We met it for the first time in 1950, when Rosalind Franklin, an amazing scientist, a woman, took a picture of it. But it took us more than 40 years to finally poke inside a human cell, take out this crystal, unroll it, and read it for the first time. Well, the code comes out to be a fairly simple alphabet, four letters, A, T, C, and G. And to build a human, you need three billion of them. Three billion. How many are three billion? Well, we don't really make any sense as a number, right? So I was thinking how to ex I could explain myself better about how big and enormous is this code, but there is a I mean, I'm going to have some help, and the best person that is going to help me to introduce you the code is actually the first man to sequence it, Dr. Craig Venter. So welcome on stage, Dr. Craig Venter. <laughs> Not the man in his flesh, but for the first time in history, this is the genome of a specific human printed page by page, letter by letter. 262,000 pages of information, 450 kilograms, shipped from the United States to Canada, only thanks to Bruno Boding on stage, Lulu.com, a startup that did everything. It was an amazing fit. But this is the visual perception of what is the code of life. And now, for the first time, I can do something funny. I can actually poke inside it and read it. So let me take uh, some interesting book uh, like this one. And I have an annotation. It's a fairly big book. So just to let you see what is the code of life. <laughs> thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of letters that may apparently make any sense. Let's get to a specific part. Let me read it to you. A-A-G, A-A-T, A-T-A. Well, to you, it sounds mute letters, but this sequence gives the color of the eyes to crack. I'll show you another part of the book. It's actually a little more complicated. Chromosome 14, book 132. <laughs> As you might expect. <laughs> 
A T T C T T G A T T. This human is lucky, because if he will miss just two letters in this position, two letters over three billion, he will be condemned to a terrible disease, cystic fibrosis. We have no cure for it. We don't know how to solve it, and it's just two letters of difference for what we are. A wonderful book, a mighty book. A mighty book that helped me to understand and show you also something quite remarkable. Every one of you, what makes me me and you you, is just about five million of this. Half a book. For the rest, we are all absolutely identical. Five hundred pages is the miracle of life that you are. The rest, we all share it. So think about again when we think we are different. This is the amount that we share. So now that I have your attention, the next question is: How do I read it? How do I make sense out of it? Well, for how good you can be assembling Swedish furniture, this instruction manual <laughs> is nothing you can crack in your life. <laughs> And so, in 2014,、uh, two famous TEDster, Peter Diamandis and Craig Venter himself. Decided to assemble a new company. Human Longevity was born with one mission: trying everything we can try and learning everything we can learn from these books. With one target: making real the dream of personalized medicine, understanding what things should be done to have a better health, and what are the secrets in this book. An amazing team, 40 data scientists,、uh, and many, many more people. A pleasure to work with. The concept is actually very simple. We're going to use a technology called machine learning. Okay, so on one side we have genomes, thousands of them. On the other side, we collected the biggest database of human being: phenotypes, 3D scan, NMR, everything you can think of. Inside there, on these two opposite sides, there is the secret of the translation. And in the middle, we build a machine. We build a machine and we train a machine. Well, not exactly one machine, many, many machines. To try to understand and translate the genome in a phenotype, what are those letters and what do they do? It's an approach that can be used for everything, but using it in genomics is particularly complicated. And little by little, we grew, and we wanted to build different challenges. We start from the beginning, from common traits. Common traits are, are comfortable because they are common; everyone has them. So we asked, started to ask our question: Can we predict height? Can we read the books and predict your height? Well, we actually can with five centimeters of precision. BMI is fairly connected to your lifestyle, but we still can. We get in the ballpark, eight kilogram of precision. Can we predict the eye color? Yeah, we can, 80 percent of accuracy. Can we predict the skin color? Yeah, we can, 80 percent of accuracy. Can we predict age? We can, because apparently the code changes during your life. It gets shorter, you lose pieces, it gets insertions. We read the signals and we make a model. Now, an interesting challenge: Can we predict a human face? This is a little complicated because a human face is cut around millions of these letters, and a human face is not a very well-defined object. So we had to build the entire theory of it. We had to learn and teach a machine what is a face, an embedding, compress it, and if you are comfortable with machine learning, you understand what is the challenge here. Now, after 15 years, 15 years after we read the first sequence, this October we started to see some signal, and it was a, a very emotional moment. So what you see here is a subject coming in our lab. This is a, a face for us. So we take the real face of a subject, we reduce the complexity because not everything is in your face. Lots of features and defects and asymmetries are coming from your life. We symmetrize the face and we run our, our algorithm. Okay? The results that I show you right now, this is the prediction we have from the blood. Now, wait a second. In these seconds, your eyes are watching left and right, left and right, and your brain wants those pictures to be identical. So I ask you to do another exercise. To be honest, please search for the differences, which are many. The biggest amount of signal comes from gender. Then there is age, BMI, the ethnicity component of a human, and scaling up over that signal is much more complicated. But what you see here, even in the differences, 
let you understand that we are in the right ballpark, okay? That we are getting closer, and he's already giving you some emotions. This is another subject that comes in place, and this is a prediction. A little smaller face, uh, we don't get the complete cranial structure, but it still is in the ballpark. This is a subject that comes in our lab, and this is the prediction. So, these people have never been seen in the training of the machine. These are the called held out set, okay? But these are, as well, people that you will probably never believe. We are publishing everything in a scientific publication, you can read it. But since we are on stage, Chris challenged me, I probably exposed myself and tried to predict someone that you might recognize, okay? So, in this vial of blood, and believe me, you have no idea what we had to do to have a blood now here. So, in this vial of blood, there is the amount of biological information that we need to do a full genome sequence. We just need this about. We run this sequence, uh, and I'm going to do it with you, and we start to layer up uh, all the understanding we have. So, in the, the vial of blood, uh, we predict that he's a male, and the subject is a male. We predict that he's a meter and 76, the subject is a meter and 77. We predict that he's 76, the subject is 82. We predict his age, 38, the subject is 35. We predict his eye color, too dark. We predict his skin color, we are almost there. That's his face. Now, the reveal moment is that the subject is this person. <laughs> and I did it intentionally. I am a very particular and peculiar ethnicity. Southern European Italians, they never fit in models. And, uh, and it's par particularly that ethnicity is a complex corner case for our model. But there is another point. So one of the things that we use a lot to recognize people will never be written in the genome. It's our free will. It's how I look. Not my haircut in this case, but my beard cut. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to just, in this case, transfer it, and this is nothing more than Photoshop, no modeling, the beard on the subject and immediately we get much, much better in the feeling. So, why do we do this? We certainly don't do it for predicting the height or taking a beautiful picture out of your blood. We do it because the same technology and the same approach, the machine learning of this code, is helping us to understand how we work, how your body works how your body ages, how disease generates in your body, how your cancer grow and develop, how drugs work, and if they work on your body. This is a huge challenge. And it's a challenge that we share with thousands of other researchers around the world. It's called personalized medicine. It's the ability to move from a statistical approach, where you are a dot in a Gaussian, to a personalized approach where we read all these books, and we get an understanding of exactly how you are. But it's a particularly complicated challenge. Because of all these books, as today, we just know probably 2 percent. Four books of more than 175. And uh, this is not the topic of my talk, because uh, we will learn more. There are the best minds in the world on this topic. The prediction will get better, the model will get more precise, and the more we will learn, the more the, every time we will be confronted with decisions that we never had to face before, about life, about death, about parenting. So, this conversation, and we are touching the very inner detail on how life works. And it's a revolution that cannot be confined in the domain of science or technology. This must be a global conversation. We must start to think the future we are building as a humanity. We need to interact with creatives, with artists, with philosophers, with politicians. Everyone is involved because it's the future of our species without fear, but with the understanding that the decisions that we will take in the next year will change the course of history 
forever. Thank you.